Hello, and thank you for coming to this uh, tech talk. Can everyone hear me? Is the mic working? Not on. Doesn't matter, does it? <laughs> so I'm going to just briefly introduce uh, Ted Nelson. He started in the computer field in 1960. He called himself a philosopher and a filmmaker and believed that the field needed the ideas that came from him from both philosophy and filmmaking. And accordingly, in the fall of 1960, he began designing new constructs for a world of personal computing and new constructs for a world of electronic documents, which he called hypertext. And others think his visions of personal computing and electronic documents have come true, but Nelson sees these worlds as having gone all wrong. Personal computing should make life easier, and deep hypertext should make personal computing easier as well. Make the processes of writing, annotation, version management, document, intercomparison, and content reuse easier. Nelson believes all these are still possible and that it is still his duty to make things right. And what he's going to do today is explain to us how we might do it together. Thank you. Ted Nelson. I'm very pleased that Google has announced its objective as organizing all the world's knowledge. That's always been my objective, too. But the approach I've taken has gone in very different directions from the computer world. One of the things I've discovered is that the clearer your vision, the harder it is to explain. Because that means there are more and more de details for the other people to assimilate. My dear friend Doug Engelbart has this same problem. In fact, a lot of us old timers have the problem that nobody sees the way we originally thought it should be. And like Doug and various others, uh, uh, Ken Iverson, Al Bork, I continue to work on my original vision, trying to ignore the misunderstandings that have produced the present world. I believe that, and I have not tried to exhume all my notes, but they're notes I have in profusion, I believe that in the fall of 1960, essentially within two or three months of starting a computer course, I had a whole vision of a world of personal computing, an industry of personal computing which would change the world, because it was obviously clear that the computer screen would be the home of human work for the indefinite future. Now, there were very few at that time, but hey, I had brochures from Digital Equipment Corporation that showed screens. I'd seen NORAD pictures. What more do you need? The point is, <clears throat> once you understand what programming is, hey, it's all in principle, very simple. It's all just a small matter of programming, or jazz mob. <clears throat> so essentially, the first question I asked, because I also had a universal vision that gradually crystallized as a vision of a world of self-publishing hypertext for the whole of humanity, I asked, how can we improve on paper? That's not what they asked at Xerox Park. What they asked at Xerox Park is, how do we imitate paper with all its deficiencies, its rectangular imprisonment, its restricted connecti connectivity, its lack of space? And so we have Microsoft Word, Adobe Acrobat, and the World Wide Web, all of which are simulations of paper under glass. Because you can't write on it, you can't put sticky notes on it. Oh, there are always these, these, these little fringe applications, but nothing general. They can be used by everyone. So to this simple question, how do we improve on paper, I thought of many possible answers. But one kept coming back to me from about six or seven different pathways, we can keep each quotation connected to its original source. 
Now, what does that mean in today's formats and terms? Absolutely nothing. Because that's not what they did at Park. And that's not what the paper wallopers chose. In imitating paper, you see, they wanted to sell printers. <laughs> they wanted to feed the paper publication process. Whereas it seemed to me, the objective was to free the human race from the prison of paper. So, see each quotation in its original context, you say. Keep every quotation connected to its original source. Now, this is manifestly impossible, isn't it? No, it's not. It's quite possible. And here we are. This is our first demo of the Xanadu Transquoter, which you can download from Xanadu, Australia. And it is a collage of quotations from here and there. As I move the mouse across, each quotation is separated. And when I click, there's the original context. Okay? We'll do it again. Original context. How are we doing that? <clears throat> because through, through an ingenious use of cascading style sheets on this and a compliant server at the University of Southampton, the ePrint server, which some of you may know, which has as a default setting the delivery of context. When will it deliver this context? Why? When you use an EDL. Let's, let's look at another. In honor of my partner, Marlene Malicote, let's, uh, let's look at the one she created, which is a little more coherent. If I can find the cursor, there we are. What does information want? Information wants to be expensive. Who said that? Oh, is it coming in? There we are. Uh, information wants to be free. All right, here's another one. Okay, now how do we do this? We do this by a different representation of documents. You see, there is a tradition in some quarters in the computer field of what we can call uh, righteous oversimplification. Let's solve this problem by doing the first 60%. They say, I think that was a Bell Lab slogan. Then we'll worry about the rest. But of course, very often by that time, you're so embroiled with the problems of the first 60% that you never get to the rest. And more important, you'll never get to the moon that way. There are some problems that have to be tackled as a whole, no matter how big. So the simple notion of documents, the way documents have been done, oh, I may bring this back. How documents have been done is like Scrabble tiles in a box. A document is newborn. We'll call this a simple document. A document is newborn or assumed to be newborn, and each character is simply a consecutive piece in this long row of characters. It has no identity. It doesn't know where it came from, and there you are. Well, that gets you a certain distance but it certainly doesn't ring the bell, as far as I'm concerned. Let's start look at the format for the documents I just showed you. Here again was the transquotation page. I'll put that up. And we'll look at the, um, the EDL which generated that. What is an EDL? Excuse me. I have to find it on the net, sorry. <laughs> we go to Xanadu, Australia. Here we are. No, we go to... Uh, Xanadu, Australia. And... I thought I had an EDL in there. EDL is a Hollywood term, and it refers to edit decision list. If you make a, if you make a video, if you make a movie, 
you take your footage to the so-called uh, offline editing system, which, yeah, offline editing system, and there you transfer all the footage to stuff you can view on the screen. Now you rearrange it and choose the final or semi-final structure of what you want to show. It then spits out a floppy disk or puts something on your thumb drive, which is the list of shots, one at a time, that uh, will generate the actual movie you want. You then take that list of shots to the uh, so-called online session, and it copies all the video shots onto the final tape. So an EDL is a listing of the portions to be put together. Now, this is only done with, um, with uh, video and movies at the present time, but in fact, so I'm, here we are. Here's the, here's the EDL for what I just showed you coming at us. Right. So this is a little longer, a little wider than you wanted to be. <coughs> Here is the document from which we're quoting. Or rather, here's the document from which we're quoting. And there's th to this we have appended an address within the document saying, I want to start with character 1942 and go on for 879 characters. And similarly for the rest. So it extracts a string, and that extraction is done at the server, but do does not have to be, uh, thus concatenating the resulting piece. Now, why do you want to do that? There can be a number of reasons. One of them is that you can edit the document and the addresses of the content never change. This is the key. You see, everybody says, how can you possibly have non-breaking non links when people change the document? And the answer is, if you distribute an EDL, and the links are to spans of content, they do not break. All right, that is enough. That was kind of abstract. What are we, we seem to be, if I don't wiggle the mouse, it goes dark. Let us look then at the, uh, at what this results in when we go to the new version of what my group is working on. There we are. Okay. I'm one of those people who keeps clicking when things don't happen, and that's not always a good idea. Okay. So here is a document space, let's see, running two windows on a, on a screen is, takes a little more skill than I have. There we are. Okay. Here is a cluster of documents. If we had a nice fast graphics machine, we'd see much better what's happening. Hundreds of millions, I think. Anyway, millions of teenagers have wonderful graphics software. And they get fabulous response, but nobody's been using this kind of thing for documents. This was partly designed by a teenager. We're still trying to fix it. <laughs> this is a prototype. The do the the system is called Xanadu Space, and we expect to give away the viewer and sell the editor. And what you're seeing we call a flight of, I'm just trying to position this thing, sorry. What you're seeing we call a flight of documents, a flight of four documents. And on the left, well, we can zoom in on it. This is a familiar document known as the Declaration of Independence by Thomas Jefferson, promulgated in 1776, uh, not as sharp as it ought to be. I can read it from memory. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We have linked this to a corresponding paragraph in the Virginia Declaration of Rights. Very slow response here, because partly because we're refreshing the documents 
in full and not optimizing right now. So in the Virginia Declaration of Rights, it says correspondingly, in a rather more pedantic phrase, by, written by George Mason, that all men are by nature equally free and independent, and that they have, I'm saying from memory because we don't see it off the side, that they have certain inherent rights of which when they enter into a state of society, they cannot by any compact deprive or divest their posterity, namely the enjoyment of life and liberty with the means of acquiring and possessing property and seeking happiness and safety. So this is an important historical relationship between these two paragraphs. Oh, there we are, between these two paragraphs. Third document over is the um, English Bill of Rights, and fourth document over is the uh, is John Locke's Two Treatises on Government. I think one of the reasons that this is so big right now and so slow is that we're re we are refreshing all of John Locke's Two Treatises on Government. Now, why should there be only one view of a document? because they had a slogan at Xerox Park, WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. What does that mean? It means what you see on the screen is what you get when you print it out. This sneaky phrase propagandizes turning the computer into a paper simulator. If we want to do more than you can do on paper, WYSIWYG won't allow it. And I think we should have as many views as the, as the user could possibly want. For example, rolling up a document in a ring. For example, seeing them lined up at the top or seeing them lined up according to the link. And by the way, <coughs> we're saying not link here, but flink for a very important reason. These have no relation whatever to HTML links. HTML links are embedded and therefore can only point outward. They cannot overlap and they have no types. Need I? Well, you can read my apology in New Scientist last summer for any part I had in creating HTML links. <clears throat> because I think this is one of the worst things that's happened to the human race now, that, we are, that everybody thinks that's what a link is. Okay, so these links are first-class, freestanding objects. They are applied to the content by the addresses, the stabilized addresses of the content. So you can have any number of overlapping links of any type on this document, on any of these documents. I propose to you that this structure is a generalized structure for all media not just for text, but for audio, for video, and we can fit in everything else. <clears throat> not just this view, of course, but the fact that what we allow parallelism and intercomparison. So let me go back a little bit in history to intercomparison. Here's a picture from my very first published, or pardon me, my, I guess it was my second published piece, but. It was for the ACM National Conference. I was, what, 24? And all the computer scientists in America were there, I think, in Cleveland. And I called this zippered lists. And what does it mean? It's, it, it's rather more abstracted than, uh, I see it now and I realize why people had difficulty understanding it. The idea is you're gonna compare two things side by side and they've, they're set up in advance for comparison side by side. And this one is connected to that, and this one is connected to that. So when you bring them together, they line up so you see the corresponding parts and the differences. So this notion of intercomparison side by side has been the center of my designs for the last 46 years. And it seems to me, if, if there's one thing the web doesn't have, it's the ability to intercompare things side by side and see the differences and to annotate them the way they ought to be annotated. Yes, there are a lot of local annotation sites, but nothing general. So this is the, that's one view of it. Now let's generalize it slightly. Yeah, I've got to change the magnification. Good old Adobe Acrobat. 
paper sim. What? There we are. Yes. Sorry. Okay. Magnification did not change. Thank you. Why doesn't it want to change the magnification? Oh, okay. One, one last try. All right. So, so basically, the, this was the picture I saw, I had in my mind, of how documents would weave together for side-by-side -side intercomparison over an ever-expanding ever tissue. So I stand by that. That is the general idea, and I've just shown you the structure. It took us a long time to work out that structure. The uh, first structure I came up with was at Brown University, or the first structure I implemented was at Brown University, and that was, where is it now? <clears throat> so this two-window thing really is a challenge. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> this was one, one of the sheets of paper I worked out for <clears throat> for the pres as we were starting firing up the Brown project. But here we see essentially the uh, hypertext we know now, except that's with direction that's without direction. Uh, there's another one somewhere in this complex with, with the arrows. So this was the simplification I came up with in 1968 because the guy at Brown was in a hurry. But my team with the Xanadu project, as far as I'm concerned, came up with this true structure of documents in 1981. And that's what we're working with now, and that's what I've just presented to you. Essentially, by we can fulfill all of these criteria, all of these separate objectives of a document in one structure. Nothing is embedded, not even formats. Links are applied from outside. Links become user selectable. And transclusions are not tracked, but discovered from the addresses. So let's talk about transclusion. It seems to mean two different things. If a document sends for a piece from somewhere else, I call that transdelivery, because it is coming from the other place. Transclusion, I define as the same thing knowably in two places, so that we can compare side by side and know that this quotation is next to its original, whether or not the version of that quotation we're seeing came from a cache or somewhere else. Transdelivery is now supposedly appearing in certain web formats. Transclusion of the kind I'm describing is a little trickier because, of course, it, we want to set it up for side-by-side -side intercomparison. We want to be able to use the side-by-side -side structure, which is natural to documents. Don't you want to be able to annotate everything? Why can't we annotate audio recordings? Why can't we annotate video? Because of the narrow hermetic view everyone has taken of these separate things, as if they were separate. Whereas there is only one media conglomerate in the universe, and we want to understand it all. So being able to annotate it, being able to structure it, being able to restructure it in place, re-edit it in place without changing it, all these things are vital. <coughs> Why do we want to see what contents are the same? Well, some of us are more scholarly in orientation than others, but I have an anecdote. I was once editor of a magazine called Creative Computing, and someone submitted a paper on the small talk language. Now, I had been irritated by the way that small talk was being hoarded by Xerox Park. They were not giving out information about it. And Alan Kay had had an article in Scientific American about small talk, which I thought was pompous and otiose and difficult to understand, whereas this new article that it was submitted to me was clear, on the button, and excellent. So I ran it. Guess what? Some bozo had retyped Alan Kay's article, changed every instance of we to they, and submitted it to create a computing magazine. And I had not recognized it. 
Why was it so much better written than Alan Kay? <laughs> because something had changed in me. And if I were not able to know these articles were the same, I would not have had that lesson. Of course, the guy who wrote it really got a lesson. Uh, both Alan and I wrote to his uh, academic department asking for mercy for him, but uh, he was out. <laughs> the, uh, so I believe that being able to master and understand the relations of documents and their history is very, very important. And this kind of recognition of where things come from, which we do not have as a facility and therefore don't miss. If we had it, what could we do? The idea that next to every quotation, you can see its original context anytime you like. The idea that, uh, okay, you watch, you watch on the TV excerpts from movies. I want to say, hey, I want to see the rest of that. Keep going. Why can't we do that? You want to be able, I would like to be able to take a DVD and re-edit it. It's my DVD, okay? <laughs> I can create a new list of the pieces in it, see them any way I want. Maybe some people won't like that till they see a new revenue stream. The point is that we want to give people control and understanding of all media. And right now, the extremely limited formats that hold us back, uh, I think, need to be shaken a little bit. Now, I spent the 1990s, partly in Japan, trying to understand the world of the desktop as it was evolving and the world of the web and see how I could fit my stuff in it. I'll show you one example, which, was, which we called um, Cosmic Book. I proposed in 19... 72 that we should have side-by-side -side interconnection between hypertext documents and people said oh Nelson doesn't understand computers but we finally implemented this in Windows like so so here we see can we see them oh. Are we not seeing the lines between them? Well, dang. OK, I think maybe I've got too many applications open. All right, never mind that. In any case, that's, that's the lesson. You would be seeing, if this were working properly, you would be seeing a line between this and that, <coughs> between each of these separate windows. I guess the machine is overloaded. But that, basically, the, the difficulty of implementing this using Windows tools and using a standard, standard Windows, uh, windowing methods, made it clear to me that I can't work that way. And similarly for the web, that nothing I want to do can be done in the web browser. That uh, for that, we have to go to an entirely different viewing mechanism. And that's what we're starting with here. As I think I mentioned, uh, the viewer will be free and the uh, editor 30 bucks probably to begin. And that will allow you to create flights of documents like this. So instead of sending unannotated, unlinked documents to people, you can send a flight of documents like this with ever so many different link types and transclusions open and ready for the viewing. So that is essentially the kind of structure we now see. Let me, op let me give you another example of the uh, Xanadu space structures. This is essentially today's implementation of the picture you see there. Just have to wargle around with the keys just a little bit. Sorry. And 
turn it. Sorry. There we go. Okay, here we have three documents that were just lying around my computer. And we have created a little table, a little transclusive table of contents here. I'll zoom in on it. Sorry. <clears throat> so this consists of a series of headlines transcluded from the actual document. So the words Xanadu space, hypertext, transclusion, and so forth are featured on it. All it is is a table of contents for going around the others. So now as we step through it, you'll see on the left we step to the next item in the list and everything lines up accordingly. Now, if you're like me, and if you're like some writers, this might be the current version you're working on, this might be an outline, and this might be all the stuff you'd like to work into the document if you have time. So this structure keeps them lined up side by side by side in the way that other documentary structures do not. So that is just a, just a hint at the kind of working mechanisms we can build with this. Now, if you're, it seems to me this would be very useful for, for programming. Conventionally, programmers embed their comments, embed uh, their labels, and so on. But there's no reason that these can't be side by side for a simpler way of reading the contents. So this gives you a different way of seeing and manipulating documents using transclusive uh, table of contents. So, in this infrastructure, everything is a transclusion, meaning that all you have is a series of pointers to spans. They can be locally, local spans of text, they can be remote spans of audio, etc. These to be composited in the, viewer, in the viewer. The links or flinks are then attached directly to the addresses of the content and so it must be selected by either those who are constructing the document or by the user who only deigns to turn some of them on and some of them off. But this is a highly generalized mechanism and need not be restricted by any particularities of the uh, structure. Now this leads to the copyright solution I've always wanted. Here was my idea in the fall of 1960. And again, as I say, as an early adopter, I was always an early adopter. At the age of six, I guess it was, I sent for things you strapped on your shoes that had springs, imagining myself going down the block at enormous speed and immediately sprained both my ankles. When I was 12 or 13, I dreamt of having my own Earth satellite. So when everybody was astounded, when most people were astounded that Sputnik went up in 57, my view was what, the, what took them so long. And uh, I've always wanted to make life more convenient, make life easier, and increase human knowledge. So I was very cynical as a young man. I thought, God, there's no hope for politics. There's no hope for change the economic system. There's certainly no hope for the educational system. What can I believe in? And then I discovered the computer. Uh, wait a minute, now we can make people smarter. Now we can make people smarter. So what are the document structures that will really increase human understanding? So the simple hypertext we have now was a part of that, yes. But I think we have to go much further. Now, the copyright system I envisioned, and this was all, I think, within the first three to six months of thinking about this. Okay, let's, let's go back to the frame of mind I had. I thought I would try to build something like what is now AOL. It would be the utility, something like perhaps Google. <laughs> 
you would sign on and you would publish anything. You would pull out a document and if copyrighted portions were used, you would be billed for those sections which you then owned. So it would be like buying a book, even though whenever you came back to the machine, you owned those portions. And when you publish something, correspondingly, if other people read them, you would get a royalty as well. Now, I think that's pretty good. Why, in a world where copyright is, some say, under threat, continue to hold this view? Because the big copyright holders are not going to let go. They own most of the stuff, okay? And while Creative Commons is great for new small publishers, it's not going to shake loose the academic presses or Hollywood vaults or any of the writings after 1922. So the objective, from, as I see it, is to engage the publishing industry in a new form of micro-purchase. So let's take, let's transpose that first notion that, which I gave you as a very simplified picture of how to do it from a single utility. Let's transpose it out now to today's dis distributed system. How could it possibly work in today's distributed system? And the answer is through a system of micropayments allowing each person to buy individual quotations selected. What about getting permission to publish the quotation? You don't need it because all you're sending out is an EDL, which invites the user to bring in this piece or that piece. Nothing wrong with that. Now the question is, do you have a legitimate way of obtaining that piece? And for those publishers who sign into this form of publishing, it will be a new revenue stream, I hope. Already, it's a small start, but the biggest publisher in Brazil will be putting their travel articles under this system as an experiment. And uh, I'm working with the people at Creative Commons to put the trans-copyright license. We call it trans-copyright because it is a copyright license, and so it has C in the circle in the middle. But if you put trans in the front, it is saying, and you too may use it and quote it freely according to the two criteria. One is that each downloader obtains each quotation separately to fill the holes in the EDL. And secondly, that each quotation remains connected to its original context so that nothing is out of context and the reader may, if desiring, continue on in that same content. Now, copyright is a difficult area to tread because almost everybody's heels are dug in for their own position. And it's extremely hard to get this position heard because it does not fit the current fight, the current copyright fight, which is essentially reminds me of the fight in Fantasia between Tyrannosaurus and Stegosaurus. We'll steal it all. You can't have any. We'll steal it all. You can't have any. And I'm saying there's a win-win solution in between that changes the granularity of purchase, the granularity of ownership, and liberates and benefits everyone. Now, I suggested in the write-up that if transclusive formats come in, they certainly ought to be recognized by Google so that instead of just saying there's a document here, you can also mention somehow that the other sources from which it comes and provide that line of connection for those who want to maintain or follow those connections. So some people have accused me of insisting on perfection. And I say, no, 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 no. I don't want things to be perfect. I just want the 90% of hypertext that the web cannot possibly deliver. So thank you, and I'll be happy to hear anything you say. When you publish the EDL, you have an ISP, and you're paying the ISP to put it there, as with today's web documents. Someone downloads it. If the content is free, then the EDL is fulfilled at no cost. If some of the content is not free, your, inquiry, your request reaches the server of the publisher. A micropayment request is then made. For the user. To, to, to the downloader. And if, if that transaction is successful, it comes in. 
the, uh, I, su I strongly suggest a watermark with, the, with a receipt rather than stronger uh, DRM, certainly to start. And I, I don't favor DRM, but I do hope people can see the benefit of this. Thank you. Um, yeah. Should I? Yeah. Um, oh, oh, sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry. I didn't see the microphones. Thank you. Yeah. OK. Um, in transcluded content, how do you deal with derivative works that want to take content from an original source and change it uh, into something new that is still related to the original source, but is not an exact copy of it? Well, that's just that's something else. That's a corresponding and 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 uh, and, uh, and counterpart structure, and whether or not it's a copyright violation is none of my business. That's the problem of the uh, of the uh, of the rights holders. If we want to register it, then you create a flink that says this is a corresponding this 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 portion corresponds, or uh, or should be compared to this. One thing I did not understand was. Uh, the way you refer to things, you talked about character positions. About what? Character positions, yeah. And uh, this creates for me a problem, because it means that if I want to make a document available for transclusion, that means that I have to promise to keep it available and unchanged for all time. Mm -hmm. Because if I change one character, then all the, all, all the quotations change. No, you Is change it right? by EDL. You distribute an EDL, which then <laughs> makes that uh, uh, I'm, talking, I'm talking as the guy who holds and controls the original text yes. that the EDL is pointing to. Yes, but then, but then you, your next version that you promulgate is also an EDL. We regard okay, so, that, so that so original source as, as, as a source pool, and okay. then you're, you do another version, you do it as an EDL, so that the, so that the addresses don't change. So the, the original has to stay changed, that's, unchangeable that's the forever. Concept. Yes, but, but it does not restrict your changes. It only restricts the way in which you distribute them. OK, thank you. Hi. So what lessons from the adoption of the web do you think can be applied to the Xanadu system? Because I tend to say harsh things, <clears throat> and occasionally things I don't want to say, I think I'll pass on that question. In the model of a quotation you describe, um, you said that the original source is, that you don't copy the source into the, the new document. It's, it's copied by reference, essentially. To essentially. See what, I'm, I'm concerned about that in the context of, of trust. If I'm quoting, for example, a a political enemy who's made a statement that they don't want to make and have caught them out in this and I'm explaining why this is bad, what's to stop them from going and editing the original text and, and making changes so that their statement is no longer, you know, is doublespeak gone? This is not a system for controlling everybody. This is a system for voluntary participation. And if, if, uh, if people start doing that, you, you watch them. Uh, it, basically, it's people who are in the game and who aren't in the game. If you, if you make that change, you're not in the game. And obviously, uh, if we want to go on checking on who's doing what, there, we do all kinds of hash code tricks and so on to make sure nobody does. But that's another side of things. Uh, if you, yeah, yeah. Um, so he was saying you could quote the original person. I. I there are the people behind me, but the, the essential thing, essentially you're saying if you're not playing that game, you're going to need to start including text directly. The issues are the same regardless. Uh, you, you, can, you can use the same methods on uh, net and web material. It's just that the tracking issues become more difficult. Um, if you, with, for people who are within the game, it's a matter of administration and, uh, and uh, pragmatics. For people outside the game, it gets more complicated, but you're still using the same methods of tracking and uh, address equivalence and uh, caching. How do you uh, know who's 
in the game. Anytime you set up a system like this, especially when there's money involved in micropayments, you'll get a humongous community of spammers and people who try to get you to re uh, make money off you reading spam. That's a very good point. <laughs> um. I won't pay for spam, and the, the question is, how, you know, how are they going to attract me to spam? I used to read a lot of spam until I figured out that it wasn't worth it. Well, uh, so how can you tell what is spam without actually paying for it and reading it? Well, you just get, take, a, take a little bit. If it, if it says, uh, uh, in the name of God, dear so-and-so, uh, you quit. <laughs> question uh, about your impression of, I think, a, a fairly famous paper that came out in about 1968 by St uh, Dijkstra oh. uh, on the discipline of go-tos. Uh, yeah. Go-to statement considered harmful. Yes. I was wondering, when that came out, uh, what was your take on it? Did you see it relevant to things you were working on? Uh, I bring it up because I think it has, in, in, there, there's a lack of discipline. You talked about the internet. There's a lack of discipline in, in terms of forming links that uh, Going back to Dijkstra's paper, I think he, he called for a discipline within programming, and I see sort of an analogy there. Well, you might look at my piece called um, Embedded Markup Considered Harmful, <laughs> which ran in the XML journal a couple of years ago. Uh, I applaud what Dijkstra was trying to do. And what we had was first structured programming, and somehow that segued into object-oriented programming. But I don't know whether that gave us any lesson about order or not, because object-oriented programming ain't standard neither. And, uh, and the, uh, the hopes of unification that it seemed to promise have gone away. But still, those of us who try to simplify and clarify <laughs> take, uh, take inspiration from it. Thank you. I was wondering if the system had any notion of, uh, I mean, so there, do you have a notion of like different versions of a document, I suppose, where, sure. you, where you publish a different version? This is following up on a question sure. about three questions back about uh, somebody changing the original source. Um, and in some cases, you, you can release a new decision list and there are a new exactly. yeah, EDL, that, and that's the second version of the document. Mm -hmm. But what about when the original version of that, so all of the, all of the uh, clients who were quoting the original version <coughs> of the document are still quoting the original version, right? Because these are all like character length, uh, character based, character position based? Right. Now, obviously, we can, we, can, we can move on to optimizations, which, which, which say, okay, now, after version 6, we're going to go to a new base addressing thing. So, so it's not uh, locked in cement. I should tell you that, that the uh, versioning scheme we have is rather more simple than anybody else's, which just, is just saving every, every editorial change so that you can roll back and forward in time and also go sideways. This was implemented by Kenichi Unai at... Uh, KO University under my, uh, in one of my seminars, and it works beautifully. And so we are re-implementing that so that, you'll be, so that you'll be able to get an EDL for past, present, and sideways versions. And also to transclude from one version sideways to another. So maybe, maybe that's the question I'm asking. What, I, what I'm interested in is if you have links to a like, I'm, I'm interested in a particular piece of information in the document, not necessarily how it's laid out in, a particular, you know, in, in the context, uh -huh. um, but I want that fact. And say that fact in the original document is discovered to be wrong, to be, in, to be incorrect or to be slanderous or uh, libelous, I guess. Um, and that original version needs to be changed. Does the system allow for me to reference? Notice that you can rewrite it. You take that EDO and you change the part you want. Now, how, do, how does anybody know you've rewritten it? Well, there's the intercomparison facilities. That's one of the things, <clears throat> one of the things we had to drop from the, Xanadu, the, the older Xanadu structure so that finding automatically that you've changed that version would be very difficult, whereas that was also part of the spec in the 1981 Xanadu. Uh, but uh, being able to, th the fact that you can put a note on a document saying, I have changed this and you'll see my better version uh, could be beneficial to everyone. So say I, I don't know the performance specif uh, specifications of a particular car, say of a, of a Jeep, the Jeep FJ, or the, the Toyota, whatever, FJ Cruiser. 
so I, with the, with the outward pointing links, I can point to a page that says this is where the specifications are, and that's the authoritative source. Mm -hmm. Whatever they say is what I believe. But with these flinks, I'm taking a particular you know, incarnation of those specifications, and I'm tying my document permanently to that particular incarnation. Not, wait, first of all, the distinction between the EDL and the flinks. The EDL is the content which is collaged underneath, and then the flinks are any relationships or structures imposed above. Um, whether a source is authoritative or not is a social issue, you could say, social and political issue, which will not change. And, who have, and whether they have posted a thing, whether Toyota has posted it, whether, uh, versus whether uh, uh, Joe Bozo has posted it, still becomes an issue. And I think that, that is separable from the structure. Is that helpful, Roy? I guess what I'm saying is that a flink is, as I understand it, a flink is a reference to a particular subset of a particular version of a document. No, no a flink is any relation or structure which you wish to superpose, so that so that uh, a marginal note, a comment, or a jump link, a, 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 a vanilla jump link, a la the web, all of these are represented by flinks, but they are logically different in that their inclusion in a document is nominal, so that they, they may or they may or may not have bor been born in a document, but they may come from some other document. But all of this is visible. It's a it's a it's a it's a discussion. <laughs> Yeah. Thank so you. Since uh, it is turning into a little bit of a discussion, what I'd like to do is thank the speaker and invite the other questioners to come up here, have a discussion. Well, I, I have one question I think everybody might be interested in. Go ahead. Given, given you have this system, how do you get the existing corpus of paper documents into it in a reasonable way? Oh, that's a political question if there ever were one. <laughs> uh, and I'd like to know personally. <laughs> so. Um, it's uh, these, these are these are these are matters of financing. I was pleased to see an ad the other day for a library service where they come to you and digitize. I think this may very well uh, uh, bode interestingly for the future, because remember we've se we've seen uh, uh, Best Buy will send their geek squad to repair your computer on site, and similarly, uh, digitization squads uh, may be available in the future, like people who come and, and, and photograph your wedding. So I think that that's uh, <laughs> that could be one one avenue, which I hope will be uh, become affordable. I, I think you missed my point. The, oh. It's the it's the connections and the links. So if 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 an existing document has a bunch of quotes from other documents, uh -huh. how how does all that get? reconnected in a way that you would have liked to have seen it done in the first place. Hey, I guess Google will do that.